Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of of the Tournament Poker Edge podcast. I am your host, Clayton Fletcher, and I still get little tingles in my spine every time I uh, get to say that I am your host. It is a thrill and an honor to be the host of this podcast, one that I've been a fan of since its inception many years ago. And I appreciate all of the comments you guys have been giving me, uh, giving us, I should say, on either on the Tournament Poker Edge forums about the podcast or some of you have been sending tweets uh, at Clayton Comic or at Tournament Poker Edge or uh, some of you have even chosen to email me, which I appreciate. If you want to do any of those things, you can follow me at Clayton Comic on Twitter, Instagram. You can also uh, send me an email directly. I read all my emails, poker at ClaytonFletcher.com. So today uh, we are going to talk about Tournament Poker. We're going to continue a review of some of the hands that have been featured recently on ESPN's coverage of the 2018 WSOP main event. Uh, before we get to that, though, I have a few poker-related topics that I want to get into uh, for you right now. And the first one is shadiness and accountability and people just not acting like decent human beings. Uh, this obviously has been going on since the beginning of time. Poker is a gambling game, and as such, it features people of all varieties of morality. Uh, but lately, I just feel like there's a growing trend uh, in the poker community as far as poker players doing things that at least some find unsavory. Uh, we talked a few weeks ago about the ongoing debate over whether Kate Hall should be allowed to back out of her staking agreement with Chad Power. And regardless of which side of that uh, debate you happen to land on, I think we can all agree it's not good for the game for stories like this to get out there and something that's best avoided in the first place. I think we can all agree with that. Uh, yeah, so if you have a, a staking agreement or a backer, get it in writing so that we don't have these kind of problems. And yeah, the talk of the town always seems to be who's shady, who's not doing what he or she should be doing. And it's just ugly. It's bad for the game. The game is so much fun. Uh, so many of the people who play this game are wonderful people. Uh, I just don't like when things like this happen. Uh, there was a gentleman, some of you may know this story. Uh, there was a gentleman who uh, did very well in last year's World Series of Poker main event. His name is William Kasuf, and he hails from jolly old England. Uh he was best known, if you didn't catch the coverage last year, best known for what he called speech play, uh, what I call table talk that's not appropriate for the for the the level of tournament that he's playing. Um, he rubbed me the wrong way. And I have a, a sense, I don't know if it's from doing comedy or just playing poker or maybe a combination of both, but I have a sense for people. And sometimes I'll meet someone and I, or I'll see someone on TV and I'll say there's just something about that person that I don't like. I feel like the person is shady. My, you can call it spidey sense if you want, but it starts tingling and I just feel like this is someone that I wouldn't trust, I would not lend money to, and that I would prefer not to be friends with. Uh, I always had that feeling about Louis C.K. You know, most of you know I do stand-up comedy professionally all over the world, mostly here in New York City, and uh, I've had uh, occasions, just a few, maybe three or four times in my career when I shared the stage with uh, the fallen legend, Louis C.K., I can tell you honestly, I never enjoyed being in his company. Uh, it's just something about, you know how you meet certain people and you just get a sense about them. Like, you know, I just, I, you know, I would tell people, there's something about that guy, he's creepy, and what they would all say in return, like, what are you talking about? He's the most brilliant comedian of our time. He's the voice of a generation. Uh, 
everyone seemed to universally disagree that there was anything unusual about Louis C.K. Of course, now we all know that there was something unusual about him, uh, behavior that we don't condone, but it's just kind of that kind of creepiness that I tend to pick up on sometimes, maybe when others do not. So uh, perhaps it served me well in my life, maybe avoiding <laughs> getting murdered because <laughs> I don't get involved with people who might choose to murder me. So anyway, getting back to William Kasuf, I got a similar vibe from him when I watched him on TV. Uh, and then earlier this summer, I played in a small event at Planet Hollywood. I believe it was a $600 buy-in and he ended up at my table. He busted very soon after he joined our table, which uh, I felt that was good news for a lot of reasons, not the least of which was uh, I just don't like being around him. There's something about him. The same thing I noticed on TV, the feeling I get when I watch him, uh, there's something wrong with that guy. I don't trust him. Uh, I wouldn't let him babysit, you know, that kind of thing. You got to trust those feelings. We all have them. Uh, so in the case of William Kasuf, uh, he's got some big news. He has lost his sponsorship. So this happened, you know, a few weeks ago, but I want to catch people up. Maybe they don't know the story. Uh, so I don't know how to pronounce this word. So forgive me if you're in England and you know the proper pronunciation, but is it Grovner? Anyway, uh, he had a, a, uh, a sponsor called Gro Grovner, Grosvenor. I don't know how to say it. I'm sorry. But anyway, they were his sponsor. They are a casino chain in uh, London and surrounding areas. And this is the guy, William Kasuf, who would bluff you and then turn over his cards and say something like nine high like a boss. Okay. Well, anyway, Mr. Kasuf was in a casino in England and he was playing roulette for fun with some of his friends in uh, the town of Leeds, actually. So according to reports, including the police report, he was doing something called palming. Now, if you don't know what palming is, it's something that magicians do where you have, uh, you could palm a chip or a coin or even a hundred dollar bill in your hand. And it looks like there's nothing in your hand because of the way you're holding it in your palm. So apparently he was doing this with his friend that he's playing roulette and having a few drinks with. He's palming the hundred dollar chips and basically stealing from his friend right off the table. Now, uh, he gave a, an apology that I thought was probably not uh, a real apology. Uh, he said, basically, I made an error of judgment, which I greatly regret. I don't think that's strong enough language for what he's done. Uh, he stole from his friend, which is extremely despicable and uncool. Uh, so anyway, Sean Deeb kind of brought everyone's attention to this. Uh, so I want to read the statement from Will Kasuf. Uh, Last weekend, during the course of a drunken night playing roulette with my friends, I made an error of judgment, which I greatly regret. It goes on to say, as a result of this embarrassing incident, my sponsor, Grovner Poker, and I have mutually agreed to part ways. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone and apologize, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I don't think there's anything mutual about this agreement to part ways. And I was listening to... Uh, I, I love this podcast that's out there. Um, I'm going to think of the name of it in a second. Yeah, it's called Freakonomics. So it's based on the book Freakonomics that some of you are probably familiar with, a very popular uh, nonfiction book uh, that came out a few years ago, maybe more than a few years ago, actually, if I think about it. That book's probably 10 years old. But there's a podcast series that I listen to on Stitcher, my favorite platform of podcasting, uh, the Stitcher platform. I use it to listen to all my podcasts, including the Freakonomics podcast, where they were talking about how to make a good apology, how to maximize and optimize your apologies. Uh, one thing you don't want to do, I learned from listening, is give any sort of half-truth in the apology. The apology, at least, should be 100% true. So here he goes on to say that we've mutually agreed to part ways. Okay, Will. If you say so, but I doubt that this was a mutual thing. I think after Grosvenor, or however you say it, Poker, uh, realized that you were a thief who steals from his own friends, they decided to part ways and you had no choice. That's not what mutual means. And I think you know that 
given your master of, of the Queen's English, as it were, better than I am tonight. But listen, guys, it's been a long day. I've been out doing comedy tonight. actually did a charity event at Broadway Comedy Club in Times Square, New York, uh, right in the heart of Manhattan. We did a fundraiser at the club for the ASPCA. I love animals, so it's a, uh, a, a annual event that means a lot to me and something I look forward to each and every year. So that was tonight. So uh, I, my brain is a little fried, but I'm going to plow through because you guys have been promised a podcast each and every week, and we are going to get you one. So William Kasuf, a little bit shady, and then in his apology, a little bit shady. So think about the EV of an apology. The best you can do is give yourself some chance of possibly regaining the trust of the people you've wronged. You ruin that completely when you include in your apology some BS line like we mutually agreed to part ways. Just be honest. I lost my sponsorship because I did something stupid and I was drunk and I stole from my friend and I, I'm just regretful of my actions and I apologize. And that's where you should leave it. So. We can talk about uh, GTO apologies later, I guess. <laughs> but let's just talk about what it is about poker players and being noble. Uh, you know, I think whether you're trustworthy or not is important. Whether you're a person that other people can count on is important. Whether you're a good role model or not is important. Now, as poker players... We might not consider ourselves role models, but for those of us who are very interested in growing this great game we all love so much, I think we should consider the larger impact of these kind of stories getting out there, right? So look at it, the chain reaction of events that could occur. Will Kasuf, he decides to steal money by palming from his friend, which by the way is not something you can just learn to do in a day. He must have spent hours practicing that. How? How much effort does it take to get good at palming chips at the roulette table? I guess he wasn't that good at it because he did get caught. Anyway, uh, so that happens, and then people hear about that, and then it adds to the incorrect perception that poker players are a bunch of degenerate gamblers, and they're all no good, and all of that. So we don't want that, all right? And when we do things like this, it hurts everyone. So just like the Louis C.K. incident, hurt the entire comedy world at large. Incidents like this one and the controversy over staking and all of the public uh, arguments that happen in our little community are bad for the game's overall image and will make it that much harder for companies like Poker Go, Poker Central, ESPN, uh, Poker Night in America, and others to ever get mainstream sponsorship and credibility in this country. I remember I did a radio interview in Australia when I was promoting the shows that I was doing there around the time of the Aussie Millions main event, which I was also planning to play. So the interviewer asked me about uh, what's it like being a poker playing comedian, which is a question I get a lot. I kind of made a little bit of a, a joke about how poker is not legal online all over America like it was at the time in Australia. I think that's changed since then. But that's another story. And uh, the host, the radio host that was interviewing me was just very taken aback. Why would they make it illegal? What's wrong with poker? And it just shows the difference in our culture compared with that of Australia. Over there, there is absolutely no stigma about gambling. It's a part of life. And it's freedom of choice, much like we don't really judge each other that much if you say, I'm going to go have a drink after work. So why do why would anyone judge someone else for wanting to go play a game of cards at the casino or the local card room? Uh, so uh, I digress a little bit. But uh, if we're ever going to get to where Australia is and where other countries that are more progressive in terms of their views towards poker and gambling in general, I think we need to clean up our act as a community. Obviously... It's a preaching to the choir situation. Guys like Will Kasuf will never listen to a podcast like this and say, you know what, Clayton, you're right. I should bloody clean up my act. <laughs> That's my bad English accent. But you guys know what I mean. So uh, I just wanted to get that off my chest. 
uh, I feel like this is bad for the game and something that I hope we can minimize or completely eliminate in the years to come. So I want to hear from you guys. Uh, what do you think about uh, these kind of stories getting out there? Uh, do you think it matters? Is poker just a world of renegades? I know that my other world, stand-up comedy, it's not really a team sport any more than poker is. It's kind of every man for himself, every woman for herself. And that's honestly something I don't really like about it because I feel like we could be more of a, of a community, um, whether I'm talking about poker or comedy. Uh, it just I feel like these two fields attract a certain personality type, or at least people with certain characteristics, those being uh, a desire to avoid a schedule, uh, wanting to be autonomous and sovereign in one's own world. Uh, you know, so as a result, you get the renegades, the lone wolf types, as well as other types as well. But one thing we all seem to have in common is we don't like to be told what to do. So, uh, I mean, that's for me, I left the theater world where I used to do quite a bit of acting. Uh, I realized one day that I didn't enjoy acting because I was constantly being told what to do and I wanted to do things my way. So that's why comedy appeals to me more. All they tell me is what time to be there and how long to stay on stage. And then as long as everyone laughs, no one cares what I did. As long as it was funny and the audience had fun, I get hired again and I can keep working whenever I want and not working whenever I don't want. So clearly that is a field that uh, works for people like me, as does poker. So let me know what you guys think. Send me emails, poker at claytonfletcher.com. Uh, feel free to tweet about this and other topics discussed on today's podcast episode at Clayton Comic. Now, without further ado, let's get into some more hands from this year's main event. Okay, so first things first, I believe the coverage this year has been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, during the World Series uh, of Poker, it, there was endless uh, video for you to watch if you weren't able to be in Vegas or you were in Vegas but you weren't playing, or even for some people I saw while they were playing, want to watch any number of poker tournaments that were being streamed live on PokerGo, on Twitch, and probably some other places, and of course towards the end, ESPN for the main event, as well as the big one for uh, One Drop, whatever they call that, the million dollar buy-in, which they had again this year. So uh, if you are interested in watching hardcore serious analysis and seeing every single hand, then the Poker Go is for you, and you should subscribe immediately because it's the best. Uh, if you are a little bit more on the casual side or you just don't have 14 hours to watch a whole day of poker, uh, and you're afraid that you'll never get to the final table if you try to watch every hand played, then you can watch the one hour per week reality show that is the World Series of Poker on ESPN and ESPN2. Now, I really like what they've done this year. They've made a few changes compared with last year. The product is really different. Um, there aren't lots of chip counts. They're, they don't talk a lot about uh, three bet frequencies. There's no discussion of GTO or, uh, you know, just no, no heavy duty strategy, no black magic, white magic, stuff like that. It's really about showing as many hands as possible and trying to develop a relationship between the audience and the characters at the table. And I think this year, was particularly conducive because even more so than in recent memory, the uh, players that remained towards the end were characters to say the least. So uh, I think they did a great job of bringing this all to life, watching it, uh, even when they were watching me losing, I felt they did a great job, even though it was a little painful to relive that moment when I finished in 28th place this year. So let's talk about a hand there was a man that I had never heard of before. Some of you probably are familiar with him. His name is Jeff Trudeau. He's an American player. Uh, he lives in Florida and he travels the circuit. So he plays a lot of WSOP circuit events around the country. Um, 
I was not familiar with, with him, but I was very impressed with his play in several hands that they showed on ESPN. And the one that I want to review now comes from day six. Uh, towards the beginning of the day, 79 players left in the tournament. The blinds are 40K, 80K with a 10K ante. So the pot at the nine-handed table, as the cards are being dealt, stands at 210,000. And the payouts at this level are 91K. $91,000 US. So we're talking about, we're getting into serious money here. Uh, my man, Jeff Trudeau, has 7 million in chips and opens from early position, second position to be exact, which you probably call under the gun plus one, because that's how you learned it. I learned second position. Either way, he makes it 180. So the big blind is 80, and he raises to 180 with the ace of clubs, jack of clubs. So ace, jack of clubs, folds all the way to the button, who is Lorinus Levinskis, and he's got about 5 million behind, Jeff having 7 million behind, and Levinskis calls on the button. I don't want to tell you what Levinskis has in this hand until the end, in case you haven't seen it on TV, and you can play along with me and Jeff Trudeau. We're going to be in Jeff's shoes. A lot of you have commented, by the way, uh, in your feedback, that you like the way I don't reveal all the hands before we talk about the hand history. Um, and I know we all try to think in terms of ranges, and range, ranges are very important. Uh, however, I don't want to influence anyone that's still working on uh, thinking only in terms of ranges. You might say, well, what did he have? What did he have? So we're not going to talk about what he exactly had in this exact spot. But you know, realize that that's not the right way to <laughs> look at poker anyway. You're supposed to think always in terms of ranges. Uh, so what is his range? What is my range? So in this particular hand, I have ace-jack of clubs, but I would obviously open with a lot more hands than that. So the flop comes, only uh, Levinskis calls. So there's 470 in the pot, and the flop comes 6-5 deuce with one club, the six of clubs. So it's a rainbow flop, and Jeff, we are first to act. Now here's a spot where we have a decision. Uh, I think a lot of us would go ahead and continuation bet this here. And some of us would say, well, if my ace high is no good, uh, I'm not going to be able to bluff a better hand with it, at least not on the flop. And so with that logic, a lot of us would not continuation bet. So I actually agree with all of you. I would sometimes continuation bet this and sometimes not. What I base this on might be different than most of you with a more of an online background, but I like to look at my opponent as the flop comes. If I feel that my opponent does not like the flop, I would be more likely to see bet it and go ahead and take the pot down and also protect my equity in the hand, not give him a free card to beat me. If I really think that based on his reaction to the flop, uh, he doesn't like it, uh, I will go ahead and try to take it away. If I think he does like it or I can't tell, which is usually the case, uh, I would probably check which might result in something like a 60-40 split in the 60% of the time I would check the flop and maybe 40-ish percent of the time I would bet it if I have a read that my opponent doesn't like the flop. And that's kind of the beauty of live poker is when your decisions are close, you can let the nonverbals that you're picking up and the tells, whatever you want to call them, and some of you like to say live reads, well, what's the opposite of that? A dead read? I don't know, but you guys all say live reads. So I would trust my read uh, if I had one. And if I felt like my opponent was on empty, I would go ahead and bet and take it down. Now, I don't know enough about how uh, Jeff Trudeau plays uh, to know whether any of that factored into his decision making, but he opts to check. And our opponent in the hand, Lorinus Levinskis, Kind of fun to say if you practice. Bets 400K into the 470K pot. So that's a big bet, especially in a tournament. Uh, most tournament players like to bet around half the pot or maybe even a little bit less um, with their entire range in a spot like this. So the bet sizing is somewhat polarizing. I think whenever you deviate from the standard bet size in a spot, you're kind of doing it just to mix up your play, or more than likely you're doing it because you either have a very strong hand 
or you have nothing. Uh, in other words, I think it's unlikely that Lorinus, I just said it was fun to say, and now I can't say it. Lorinus Lovinskis would make this wager with, say, for example, Ace Deuce for like a pair of deuces or, you know, some small piece of the, of the pot. I think he either crushed the pot and he's betting 400K, hoping we have an overpair, or he missed it and is just trying to take it down with a big bet. And that would be my read. I'm not sure if any of that factored into Jeff's decision, but he did call the large bet. So it, it goes check, bet 400 into 470, and then Jeff holding only ace high calls with ace jack of clubs. Maybe he's hoping there's another club on the turn. Maybe he thinks his ace jack is good enough, often enough. But when the bet sizing is that large, guys, that you got to be good a lot. I mean, you have to be right almost uh, a third of the time uh, to make any money on this. So, so he does call, and now we're going to see a turn. Uh, the pot is now 1.27 million, and the turn card is the king of spades, which puts two spades on the board. There's a six of clubs, five of spades, deuce of diamonds on the flop, and now a king of spades on the turn. Hero Jeff Trudeau is first to act, holding only ace-jack high with no possibility of making a flush anymore. And Trudeau checks. Here, Mr. Levinskis puts out the big guns. He breaks out the big guns and bets 930K into the 1.27 million pot. So that also is a very large bet. Uh, it's about five-sixths of the pot. Is that right? Yeah, that's approximately what he's betting here. Uh, a large percentage, over 80% of the pot here on the turn. So now I think I can speak for most of our listeners when I say this is a pretty clear fold without a significant read. Uh, I don't think that I've ever called with Ace Jack in a spot like this with a bet sizing like that. Uh, and especially when you consider my opponent only has 3.3 million behind uh it's not like i have huge implied odds if i make a pair that's end up being good on the river i don't know uh i just don't i don't know why but jeff trudeau faced with yet another very large bet he takes about two minutes by the way and then calls with the ace jack of clubs i can only think that he had some kind of soul read on his opponent and figured out that his hand was good often enough uh, to make the call. Now the river comes the queen of hearts for a final board of six, five, deuce, king, queen, with no possible flush. And there is 3.1 million in the pot. And Jeff Trudeau, first to act, checks to Levinskis, who shoves with very little hesitation 3.3 million into 3.1 million. Now, uh, this is a just impossible. I mean, if I if I called the flop and I called the turn, and now I called the river, you know, I'm faced with this large bet on the river. Uh, I don't know how I, how you can pull the trigger on a call. Um, one thing that could lead me to consider calling if I got to this point in the hand, which I don't see how I ever would have, would be to you know just the timing tell uh generally speaking when players act very quickly they're not value betting i mean when we value bet we like to think how much do i think my opponent can call let me get a read on him and try to figure out how strong he is so i can size my bet properly and hopefully get the maximum value for my value hand um when it's just you know the card comes and then he's immediately all in that seems to be representing strength and very often, especially, you know, depending on your player, your opponent's skill level, this could signify a, uh, a bluff. So I don't know if that would be enough for me to call with just ace high here, but somehow Jeff Trudeau makes the decision to call and Levinskis turns over the eight, seven of diamonds. So on the flop, he had an open ender, 
the turn didn't help, but he just continued to show his aggression. And then on the river, he knows he can't win the hand with just eight high. So he bets his tournament life on it. And uh, Trudeau busts him out of the tournament and he wins $91,000 for 79th place. Now, I found that hand fascinating. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Uh, a lot of dynamics at play there. Um, I think the most interesting hands to watch are big pots where nobody has much. Uh, those are always, <laughs> to me, more fun to watch than when one player has aces and the other one has kings and they just get it all in pre-flop or you know any other kind of like obvious value situation. Uh, here's a hand where Jeff has a bluff catcher and plays it passively. And I remember reading a book that Eric Lindgren wrote a long time ago called Making the Final Table, where he goes into great detail about how much money he's made in his career checking and calling. And that's exactly what Trudeau does in this hand. He plays the hand very passively, except for pre-flop. He doesn't take one single aggressive action, and yet he ends up with his opponent's entire stack. But think about how playing that way is so difficult because now you put yourself in a position where you need to make the key decision. I prefer to put my opponents to a decision and I don't often play in this manner, uh, maybe because I don't have enough confidence in my reading ability and I think I probably would have <laughs> run screaming and folded a long time ago. Somehow Trudeau gets to the river and somehow he feels that uh, Levinskis has enough bluffs and he makes the call. So good for him and I want to give him a lot of credit because I don't think that I could have played my hand the same way. All right, so now I want to fast forward to another interesting spot from the main event. This one comes from day seven, though, uh, mere hours after Clayton Fletcher busted out <laughs> in 28th place. There are now 25 players left in the tournament, and uh, the pay jumps are at 280-some-odd thousand until we get down to 18 players, and there's another jump at that point. I think to 350. Uh, regardless, there's a long way to go until then. So there's not a pay jump to consider right now. Uh, let's see. So this hand takes place early on day seven at the 120K, 240K, 40K ante level. Boy, that's a mouthful. Uh, there are 25 players left. And Sylvain Loosely, whose name may ring a bell to those who always watch the main event final table, he made it in 2013. I think he finished in fifth place that year. That was the, one of the November 9 years. Well, he's a, a French player, I believe, and he's well known for being very uh, solid. So he's solid, maybe tight, tight solid, you could say, on the rocky side. Uh, well, he opens from early position to 550, holding pocket queens. Uh, Ryan Pham, who's a young guy that's been uh, very likable, at least in the TV coverage, uh, complimentary of his opponents. Um, he looks like a flashy player, but then he acts like a young gentleman. He three bets to 1.48 million. And only loosely the original Razor calls. Ironic that the guy's name is loosely when he's actually pretty darn tight. Um, the players have very similar stack sizes, right around 11 million. So uh, we are, I mean, before the hand starts. So now we put in 1.48 million each pre flop. And uh, loosely is holding pocket queens. And Pham, who three bet, is holding pocket kings. So this seems like a no-brainer hand to me. I remember when I was watching this hand and I saw that the stock to pot ratios was right around three. Uh, I thought any three low cards flop and Mr. Monsieur loosely is going broke. Uh, it just seems like a you know, very standard spot. And so anyway, they see a flop and it's, 10 8 8 with the 10 of spades and one of the eights is also a spade so 10 8 8 with two spades 
uh, loosely with the overpair queens checks and fam into a pot of 3.6 million and with only less than 10 million behind bets 1.25 million now let's talk about this bet now first i don't mind the check at all loosely check to the razor whatever play in flow i didn't mention the um positions but fam is on the button and loosely is in early position uh so i i don't mind loosely's check on the flop i think that at this blind level uh there's actually nothing wrong with just getting it all in with pocket queens but maybe uh main event the way people tighten up and play cautiously in the main event you you probably can't get called by a better hand I mean, except by a better hand so maybe that's not a good strategy but uh i don't know i just think you know i mean look at it. there's already uh there's seven hundred thousand in the pot before they even deal the cards and we only have 11 million behind so where i'm from we say my m is 15. so the you know i think it's pretty defensible to get broke with the third nuts when your m is 15. Anyway, uh, <laughs> a lot of you guys have been teasing me about my use of M, but I'm bringing it back, especially in this era when the big blind ante is coming into popularity and a lot of the casinos are not doing the normal ratio between the small blind and the big blind and the big blind and the ante. We need to know how much is in the pot. M is just SPR preflop. Okay, I'm going to say that every episode until you guys leave me alone about it. <laughs> anyway, uh I don't mind the check on the flop check to the razor. I hate this bet by fam. I think that he should make a much larger bet with his overpair. Uh, you know, what are you worried about? You have pocket kings on a 10, eight, eight flop. Your, your goal should be to get the stacks in. Your opponent could have a 10 and not want to fold. Your opponent could have a flush draw and not want to fold. Uh, your opponent can have a straight draw and semi bluff check raise you with it. There are so many good things that can come from making a normal size bet here he bets just about one third of the pot and what he does is he fails to get pot committed with the overpair when your spr is three and you have an overpair on a flop like this i think you should be looking to get pot committed on the flop and getting your opponent committed as well more importantly actually so anyway uh loosely makes the easy call i don't see any reason for loosely to raise to check raise he's got queens uh he needs to turn them into a bluff catcher at this point there's always the chance that the three bet came from kings or aces uh, there's even a small possibility that uh fam is betting so small because he three bet pre-flop with pocket tens and now has a full house or even pocket eights and flop quads i think most of us would probably check those hands that's probably a mistake to do so, but we do it. So anyway, uh, loosely doesn't need to check raise because he probably can't get called by worse. So anyway, uh, he does call. Good play by loosely. The turn is the tray of diamonds. So our board is now 10, 8, 8 tray and still two spades out there. No flush yet. And loosely checks to the razor again. And I can't believe my eyes as I watch Ryan Pham check behind with the pocket kings in this spot. Uh, I don't know what he's thinking. Are you worried about an eight? Are you trying to play for deception and maybe try to get called by ace high on the river? Uh, I just, I don't know what the logic of this bet is or this non-bet is. I just think it's a mistake no matter how much I think about it and all the possibilities I try to come up with in my mind. I hate this check because it virtually guarantees I can't stack my opponent. And when you have Kings in this spot at this blind level with these stacks, you need to be trying to get the stacks in. Uh, maybe it's because people have jitters on the main event. Everybody's thinking about that final table. I don't want to go broke. Maybe he's worried about aces. I don't know, but it's, I think I cannot get on board with this check now the river comes the eight of diamonds um it's a the third eight now so our final board is eight eight ten six eight 
uh, no flush, not that it matters, loosely checks again. And this time with uh, six million in the pot, fam bets 2.875 million. Uh, loosely calls, obviously he cannot fold, getting that good of a price, uh, three to one with an overpair, a full house actually now, we have eights full of queens and loosely makes the call. So it looks like Ryan Pham wins a nice pot with the Kings here, but I think he played this hand terribly. I think that he had every opportunity to get his opponent's entire stack. And that's what we call leaving chips on the table, which is a cardinal sin. Uh, we need to get value for our big hands. Don't have monsters under the bed syndrome. Don't worry that your Kings are no good when they're going to be good so often. Uh, I don't know. I, I just don't get this kind of poker. And it was uh, it actually made me angry <laughs> to watch that hand on TV. Are you guys like me? Do you yell at the screen when somebody does something that you really disapprove of? Uh, maybe it's just me, but I, I cannot abide this kind of, of poker. And I was very upset. I liked Ryan Pham before that hand and after that. And I said, you know what? You deserve to lose. Okay, so let's review uh, one more hand from this uh, episode. 24 players left in the main event, and the blinds are still 120K, 240K with a 40K ante. Both players in this pot are fairly deep. Um, we're going to say the effective stack, effective stack in this hand is about 18 million. Uh, our good friend, Cal Seychow, a.k.a. Portland, the guy who wears the Portland jersey and always says, Portland got the nuts, baby. He must have said that 100 million times. I know because I was at his table for the first 90 million. Uh, he opens from early position to 520. Uh, he is holding the Ace-10, Ace-10 offsuit. Uh Paolo Gonsalves calls on the button. And I'm not going to reveal Gonsalves' hand yet. I think this is the interesting hand, is the one Gonsalves has. And uh, Luca, who's another player at the table with a shorter stack, only 9 million, uh, calls from the big blind holding Ace of Diamonds, 5 of Clubs. So 3 to the flop, there's 2 million in the pot. And we're going to play this hand from the perspective of Cao Seichao. We have the Ace-10, Ace of Diamonds, uh, no, Ace of Spades, 10 of Diamonds. And the flop comes 10, 9, 7, Rainbow. So we have top pair. Uh, we are second to act because Gonsalves called us on the button. Uh, the first opponent has about 9 million behind. And our other, uh, the other two guys have about 18 million. Uh, Luca checks, and it's on. It's on hero. Say ciao. Uh, I think a standard bet here would work. Uh, most of the time, we probably have the best hand, but it's clearly vulnerable with this draw heavy flop. 10 9 7. Uh, we need to protect and or get value from hands that include an eight. Stuff like 9 8, 10 8, 8 7. We'll all probably call, as would a, a worse 10 or maybe even ace 9, ace 7, 7 6. There's a lot of value to be gotten from all of those hands, holding top pair, top kicker. So I would probably go a little big here, maybe like 1.3, 1.4 million. However, Chow, uh, sorry, Sao Say Chow bets uh, 1.15 million into 2 million, which is probably totally fine. It's about a little more than half the pot. And very, very standard bet sizing there. Uh, Gonsalves calls on the button and Luca gets out of the way. So we're going to be heads up to the turn and with 4.3 million in the pot and about 17 million behind in our stacks, we see turn card, which is a four of hearts. So the board is now 10 of spades, nine of diamonds, seven of hearts, four of hearts, and we are holding the ace. 10 off suit. Uh, we're not going to make a flush. Our opponent might. We don't know what he has yet. Uh, 
there's 4.3 million in the in the pot. Now the action's on Hero. Should Hero bet again? Are we afraid of the call on the flop? Should we play for pot control here because we only have one pair, or should we try to protect our hand and or get value from all of the possible hands I mentioned a moment ago and more? I think betting is fine and probably what I would do, given that our stacks are so deep and we're nowhere near pot commitment, I think trying to get three streets with this hand, assuming the run out isn't too ugly, uh, we, we can probably go ahead and, and try to get value here. So uh, Say Chow agrees with me. He bets a little smaller than I would though. He only puts in 1.7 into the 4.3 million uh, pot and gets called rather quickly by Paulo Gonçalves from Brazil. So now with 7.7 .7 million in the pot, and again, I have not yet revealed our opponent's hand, the river is the queen of clubs for a final board of 10, nine, seven, four, queen. No flush is possible. Uh, it's up to Chow Se Chow. All right, do we like this queen of clubs? Does that card hit my opponent's range? Does it really change anything at all? Uh, I think the queen of clubs is a pretty decent card. Um, do note though, if our opponent had called pre-flop with the king jack, he was double gutted on the flop and could easily afford to call on the flop and turn, uh, waiting to see this exact river. Um, that's one hand to worry about. The queen also hits queen jack and gives that hand top pair now. Uh, I don't think too many other hands that my opponent calls the flop and turn with have a queen. You guys could probably think of some. Yeah, I'm, okay, jack eight, but jack eight already had a straight. Uh, queen 10, of course, is possible, which means we just got rivered and we had the best hand all along and now he's made two pair. Overall, I think the right play here is to check and call. The reason I say that is because my opponent could easily have a hand like ace eight or maybe even like a eight five, a hand that had equity on the flop and turn and could afford to call particularly with my smallish bet sizing and now has nothing and can only win the pot by bluffing. Checking and getting those hands to bluff me makes money in the long run. Does it make more than value betting and trying to get value from a worse 10 or some other hand? I don't know. I find that, I think that's a little ambitious. I think betting here is a little ambitious. I don't think that given the, the board and how connected the board is, that going for three streets of value with just ace 10 here is correct. However, this time Chow Se Xiao and I don't agree. The pot was 7.7 .7 million and he bets 2 million into the 7.7 .7 million a pot, which is a tiny bet by any measure. Now, if you're going to bet here, uh, this bet is what I would call a defensive bet or a blocking bet. It's a bet that you make when you don't want your opponent to bet more. So that's fine if you don't think your opponent can ever bluff raise it. And you also think that your opponent would have bet more with hands you can beat had you checked. So that's a lot. That's a tall order. And I don't think the Brazilian has been that wild. And I don't think that he's necessarily thinking on that level. And I know that Seixal is not thinking on that level. So I think he just bet $2 million because he didn't want to check and have a tough decision to make. Um, Gonsalves disappoints him and raises our hero to $5.5 million. Okay, now you are Chow Seixiao. Should you call $3.5 million? The pot after the raise is now $15.2 million. So we're getting about 4.5 to 1 on a call. Is my hand good 17% of the time? I think it is. And I think I would just have to call 
with Ace Ten and hoped that this was a a bluff. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess as I say that, it just feels like is it ever a bluff? Um, but I I think that it would be a bluff about 17% of the time. And to me, when it's right in that area and I can't pick up any physical reads, no tells at all, I just make the call. When it's close, I give action. And maybe that's a hole in my game. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think I could fold for just 3.5 million more. I mean, there's 15.2 million out there to take down. Uh, the guys have a long conversation. Uh, at one point, Seychelles tries to get Paulo Gonzalez to talk to him and he, he obliges. He says, uh, I don't know what to do, man. And Gonzalez says, well, you can either call and see it now or you can fold and see it later. Referring to the fact that obviously this hand will make the television coverage. Uh, they go back and forth a little bit. They call the clock. Now this guy, Seychelles, he had been very frustrated because he takes a long time to make all of his decisions. <laughs> and this one was no exception. They call the clock and uh, he actually times down as the dramatics ensue and the tournament director gives him 10, 9, 8, and his hand is declared dead. Uh, I don't know. Is folding correct? I think it's close, but I think that he put himself into this position by betting so small on all previous streets and then especially on the river. I don't like his sizing on any of these streets. That said, I need full disclosure, I do tend to bet larger than most tournament players i tend to play bigger pots than most tournament players it's just part of my playing style and it's part of a comprehensive uh range construction that i've done uh allowing me to get more value from my bigger hands but forcing me to also bet larger with my bluffs um, when i'm concerned about not being exploitable which is pretty often these days as players get better and better at poker uh, against this particular lineup, I might not worry too much about GTO and would focus just primarily on maximizing all of my EV of all my decisions. Uh, had I played this hand like Seychelles, I would have called. He folded and he folded the winner. Actually, Gonzalez had pocket eights. So it's an interesting play on the river. He turned his hand into a bluff, correctly surmising that it wasn't good and that probably this bet was a scared top pair or second pair type of hand, a one pair hand that couldn't stand a raise. That said, I still think Gonzalez raise is too small and uh, he's lucky that it worked out. But I found that hand interesting because Seychelles tried to go for a thin three streets of value and was foiled by Gonzalez's uh, decision to turn his pocket eights into a bluff. All right, guys, um, that's enough talking for me. Uh, I'm <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed the episode, and I hope that we can all get together again next week when I hope to be joined by my Tournament Poker Edge friends. By the way, guys, if you're not subscribing to Tournament Poker Edge, uh, if you enjoy the podcast but you're not a subscriber yet, you know, for the price, it is absolutely the best bargain. Uh, you get very, very high level instruction for not a lot of money. Visit to tournamentpokered.com. We have a number of different uh, packages you can buy, whether you want to go month to month or pay for a year and get a bigger discount because you buy in bulk. I promise you, you will be glad that you did. Uh, there is just so much content to be consumed and to be watched and rewatched until you really master the material. You will get better at poker by joining Tournament pokeredge.com guys thanks for listening please uh rate and review on stitcher on itunes or whatever else you use to listen to podcasts send your tweets and your messages both positive and negative to at clayton comic on twitter or feel, feel free to send me an email poker at clayton fletcher.com so for everyone here at tournament poker edge thank you so much for listening
Love nobody. Everybody, everybody. 